Lovely. Thanks very much. And uh, welcome to this afternoon's uh, session, uh, update session on uh, summer 20 2021. Um, it's good to see quite a large number of people uh, signed up for this session today. Uh, we're due to go on for about an hour and a quarter, depending a little bit, I think, on how fast I go and how many questions there are. Um, and uh, that's the plan for today. Uh, obviously, today we're we're focusing on, on the A-level sciences, A-level chemistry, A-level biology, A-level physics. Um, and the way in which the session is organised, there's a series of, of general slides to, to begin with, um, because obviously the processes being followed uh, are pretty similar um, across all the different GCSEs and A-levels. So what I'll do is I'll run through some of the sort of generic information to start with, uh, which outlines some of the processes that are taking place in terms of producing your teacher assessed grades and your centre policies and all the rest of the admin. Um, and then obviously at the end, I will say something specifically about uh, A-level biology, chemistry and physics, which will mostly cover things like the practical endorsement, because obviously that is, is something which is unique to us in science and which we don't get in the in the other subjects. So that's the, that's the plan for today. Um, just in terms of questions, I know you'll have loads and loads of questions. Um, hopefully you may well discover that as I talk through, um, I, I answer things as we go. Um, because there's quite a large number of you here today, what I will probably do is not break for questions until sort of towards the end um, and then try and run through all the questions at that point. Do submit questions whenever you, whenever you want. Um, but it does mean sometimes if I'm looking at the questions at the end, it may just be simply that I'll say, I think I've already answered this as, as, as we've talked through. Um, I'm, I'm afraid it is just me today. I mean, we often with big numbers have two people, but um, we're doing so many of these events at the moment that everyone's a little bit stretched. So it's just me for today. So I'll, I'll try and keep up with the questions as we go through. There's a little bit of a rough agenda. Um, the only thing I would say about the agenda is that, uh, again, because this is based on a, on a general set of slides, um, in fact, the fourth bullet point on international qualifications isn't one that's going to be relevant for us to talk about today. Um, this session is designed only to talk about the um, the, the UK um, A-level qualifications. So if you are a school teaching international A-level, the processes for you for international A-level are slightly different, and today's session won't actually cover those, but there is more information for international centres on our website about the very different processes that are happening for the IAL subjects. So let's uh, let's sort of crack in and just say do a little bit of the sort of context of where we are at the moment. Um, as I'm sure you know, the idea at the moment is that you're assessing or putting together evidence of of, of different activities um, based on what the students have been taught. So not based on the whole specification content, but based specifically on the things that you've taught them. Um, and you're using that to uh, derive um, a grade for all of your students, um, and that is eventually what you will submit. Uh, as has already been made perfectly clear, um, there's not going to be, as was proposed and then ditched last year, there's not going to be any algorithm that comes into play. So the grades that your students receive will be the grades that you give them. Um, so even if there is a discrepancy, if there is, you know, as part of the quality assurance, if there's a disagreement about the, the, the grade that should be awarded, if, you know, if, if an exam board says we don't think that the evidence justifies the grades that you've proposed, the exam board doesn't change the grades. We simply hand it back to you and say you need to think again about the grades that you've awarded and the centres will then submit a new set of grades. So we don't change the grades at all. We might ask you to think again about them and to submit something different, but uh, the principle is that the, the grade that the student gets is the grade that the teacher has awarded. Um, obviously, to make those grades up, you're going to use a variety of, of evidence. Um, a lot of schools obviously will use assessments because, you know, why wouldn't you? you know, that's the whole idea of, of, of exams it has been to try and grade students and separate out students according to ability and knowledge. Um, in some cases, you'll use the questions that we've just provided, the additional assessment materials that went up on the website um, at the beginning of the month. Um, no reason why you have to use those. You can use any other past paper questions. You can do your own um, now you can write your own assessments if you want to, but obviously the use of assessments will be something that, that may be used. All of these are optional, so optional use of, of questions that we provided, either the additional assessments or, um, or any other past paper. 
you might use um, you might have mock exams that you've had perhaps at the end of year 12 or a mock exam that you know your students may have done at christmas um, or you know at, at some point over over the you know perhaps when they came back from lockdown um, you might in some subjects use coursework i don't think you're likely to in 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 the a level sciences because you know coursework isn't isn't really appropriate i don't think you, you, you don't really set it um, but you could use any other work, you know, classwork or homework activities um, that or in class tests that give you some information about how well the students have performed on the on the on the material that you've taught them. Uh, obviously, there's a lot of guidance on this. We'll talk about that a little bit later on. Uh, but at the end of the process, you'll submit a grade. We ask for those grades to be submitted by the 18th of June. And then the results days are a little bit earlier this year. So the, the A-level one will be the 10th of August, a week earlier than, uh, well, a week and two days, in fact, earlier than usual. And GCSE will be on the 12th of August. So there's also plenty of time for appeals and all the other shenanigans that happen um, after results are issued. So that's the sort of overall context. Uh, there's the timelines, just so you can see what's happened. So um, JCQ have published their guidance, including grade descriptors. Um, we've put out all of our additional assessment materials. They went out initially under padlock at the end of March. Uh, we've now published uh, marking exemplification. Effectively, what we've done is we've given you some sample scripts for AS and for A-level, one sample script at A, one at C, one at E with examiner commentary. Um, sort of saying, you know, what are the key features of this script that make it worth an A or a C or an E? So that's all up on the website. That's that's under Padlock. Um, we've also put up some grading um, information. Um, that's all there as well. And there's some, you know, all those additional questions that we produced at the end of March are now also open for students to see as well. Uh, we've started up what we call our, our Professional Development Academy. So there are training sessions again, I'll say a little bit later on about what's available through that. Um, but uh, all of that support is, is, is up and running, as is the support, the general support website um, for the whole process for this summer. Uh, if you're supporting private candidates um, in your school, if you've got private candidates that you're working with to try and help them through the TAG process, their entry deadline is the end of the week. Uh, sorry, actually, I think it's just after the weekend, actually, isn't it, the 26th of April. Um, then you'll be working through your um, centre policy uh, that needs to be submitted by the end of the month through the centre admin portal. Uh, one um, policy per centre, so you don't have to do a separate one for each awarding body. It's the same policy for, for all of your subjects. Um, we will then review those, um, and if we've, got, if we've got any questions, we will come back to you. Don't wait for us to do that, because in most cases, we won't go back to schools. We'll only go back if there are queries. So continue to gather your evidence, continue to make your judgments. And then the grade submission portal opens on the 26th of May. It's open for about three weeks uh, for you to submit your grades before the 18th of June. And then results days are all there as well. So that's your timelines. Um, let's sort of have a little look first at uh, what's come out of the JCQ, because you know, obviously all awarding bodies effectively for this process, we're all deferring to JCQ the sort of umbrella organisation that represents us all, and they have collated and, and put together the guidance and um, uh, particularly the grade descriptors have all come through from JCQ so that all awarding bodies are following the same uh, the same policies. Uh, please type something to the support team. Brilliant. So what's come out from JCQ, there's all of these links, by the way, um, when you get the recording, the links are all live. If you want to look at anything now, there is a list of links um, on the left hand side of your screen in the resource list. So if you want to click on any links as I'm talking and have a little look at them, I know it can be a bit difficult to juggle screens, um, but you can get to the links there or alternatively just click on the links in the, in the PowerPoint when you get the recording. Um, so JCQ, they released their guidance on the 26th of March. Um, there was quite a big document about how grades should be determined. Um, and that's that's effectively your Bible for you to follow this summer. Um, so make sure that you've had a look at that. Make sure particularly you've got um, the sort of pro forma of the centre policy, which you can then edit and submit. Um, the assessment record sheet where you can record your decisions. There's a specific uh, checklist for heads of department so you can see what's going on. And then there are grade descriptors. So the grade descriptors for 
uh, A-level science, we've done grade descriptors at A, C, and E. They are pretty generic. I know that I, I followed Twitter actually on the day on the day when they came out, and there were some quite amusing comments, particularly about the GCSE ones, um, about how useful the grade descriptors are. It's it's actually quite difficult in science to come up with a grade descriptor um, because of just because of the nature of, of, of assessment in science. You know, we, we tend to ask questions that assess a particular topic and a sort of generic grade descriptor that says a general answer is of this quality is is a little bit difficult to match up to sort of the some, some of the specific skills. So you may find the grade descriptors probably a little bit less useful um, and the grade exemplification, the graded scripts with commentary that we've produced, you'll probably find a little bit more helpful when it comes to trying to sort of work out where your students lie on the on the grading scale. Um, We've also just gone through the JCQ guidance for you, and we've produced a little sort of document which we've called 10 Important Things to Note. It's a little interactive PDF. The link is there as well. So it's just a sort of, you know, make sure you've considered these 10 key things when you're looking at the JCQ um, guidance before I'm doing your tags. So this, is also, this next slide just talks about the quality assurance process. So as you know, your centre policy has to be um, submitted to us by the 30th of April. We will have a look at all of those that, that come in across the awarding bodies. We'll look at the, 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 the quality, um, quality Assurance Centre policy from every centre. If we've got queries, we'll come back to you and ask about those. Obviously, you'll have done some internal QA on that before you submit it. Um, you then in, uh, submit your grades on the 18th of June. And then there is a second quality assurance process, which is the quality assurance process of the grades that you have produced. Now, that process isn't covered by the slides because, in fact, it was only in the Offboard blog today. So off, if you're interested in exactly what that process will be, um, do go and check out the Offboard blog. They've put something out today. But effectively, for A-level, what the policy says, the quality assurance policy says, is that every centre will be asked to submit evidence for uh, for one A-level, um, which will be five candidates worth. So you know, if you enter for you know, 18 different A-levels across your school, one of those will be selected and we will say we would like to see the evidence for five candidates uh, for that particular subject. Um, and uh, that evidence needs to be provided within 48 hours. We'll ask for that evidence um, starting in the week beginning the 21st of June, and every centre will be asked for evidence. It might be from A-level, it might be from GCSE. If it's from GCSE, we'll ask for two subjects, one of which will be English or Maths, and the other will be a different subject. But again, it'll be five candidates, and it'll be a sort of random selection of subjects. We'll then have a little, uh, we'll then subsample that effectively. So we'll have had that in from all 1,600 or how many centres there are across the UK. Each awarding body will then do a, a sample of those. Some of those will just be taken randomly. We'll randomly pick some schools to make sure we've got a balance across you know, different types of schools, different regions, um, you know, some sitcom colleges, some independent schools, some ma maintained schools, some free schools, and so on. Um, but also we'll specifically target schools where, something, where, where there's something unusual in the data. So particularly where there's been a very large change in numbers of entries um, so, you know, suddenly the schools have gone from making 20 A-level um, submissions to suddenly making 400 A-level candidate submissions, then you know, obviously we'd quite like to look at that. Or if there's a very, very big change in outcome. Um, so, you no, know, historically your school has, has only ever got 20% grade A average across all A-levels, and this year um, your submission is for 80% grade A across all subjects, then yeah, we'd probably specifically look at what you've done. So as I said, we'll sample those, we'll have a look, if, we'll have a look at the evidence. Um, and if we don't think the evidence justifies the grades, we'd then come back to the school and say, we don't think this um, evidence fits the grades. Would you have a look at it again? Uh, so you've then got a chance to, to review that. Okay, so that, that happens uh, in that stage in July between um, 18th of June and results day. That's that process. So every school submits some evidence and that evidence is then sampled. So if you're one of the lucky schools, it may be that um, you just sail through. I don't know how many, I don't know, I have to say, because the off-call blogs only come out today, I don't know what proportion of centres we're going to be asked to, to sample. Um, but I dare say that will become apparent in the next 
um, days or weeks. Um, that this uh, is just a little bit on your centre policy. Um, so I think I've already said a lot of this actually, but. Obviously, every school must produce a centre policy. Only one needs to be um, produced. If you're submitting it to us, it goes up on the uh, our, um, our centre assessment portal, uh, which is through Edexcel Online, and your exams officer hopefully will have a good idea of how to do that. Um, you submit both the policy and the summary, and it's effectively the summaries that we will quality assure. And if we don't like the look of the summary, we'll then go and read the whole policy. Uh, but that's the, that's the way that section of the, of the QA process will work. Um, just as this one's popped in, uh, oh, perfect, Simon's already answered it for me in the group chat, but yes, five. Uh, so it doesn't matter whether it's A-level or GCSE, it's five candidates that will be, that will be um, asked for for your, uh, for your um, sample that comes to us. So the, the, the $64,000 question, what, what, are we going to, what are we saying to you about guidance on grading? So as I said right at the beginning, the important thing, obviously, is you assess students only on what they've been taught. There's no point in trying to assess them on the entire specification if there are topics that you just haven't covered because of um, interrupted teaching time this year. Um, but do make sure that, that um, students have got the opportunity to show um, a range of knowledge and a range of understanding. Uh, so, you know, where you have taught a number of different topics, do try and make sure that the assessment is across those topics. And obviously try and make sure that the assessment allows them to show their ability at higher grading standards. You know, there's, there's no point sort of just giving them assessments that are all simple one mark recall questions, uh, because that's probably not going to give you good evidence of, um, of, of attainment at the highest levels. You know, you're going to want to give them questions that are more demanding to enable them to show their ability to answer at a more sophisticated level and give you confidence in, in awarding a higher grade. So. Obviously, ranges don't want to make all the questions too easy or all the questions too hard, but do think about across the topics, making sure that the questions give give students access to, to the full grade range in terms of the answers that they can produce. Um, obviously, where you've got a whole teaching set, you want to try and make sure that the evidence is consistent across the class where that's possible. That might not be possible because of individual student absences. You may have had some students that have had uh, you know, that have had to be in self-isolation for longer um, and, and so on. Um, evidence can be of different types and can come across the course of study. So you're not, you're not just looking at where they are now. Um, obviously, you can look at what, what they were doing in year 12 and the evidence that they've built up, the sort of progression that they've built up. Um, there is specific guidance um, for each of the sciences. It's available on the website. There's a little link there. And there is, as I've said, the training courses that we're offering through the uh, Professional Development Academy. And again, I'll talk about those a little bit later on. A uh, question that's just come in on the group chat, what do I mean by holistic? Um, so I, th I suppose what I mean by holistic is I mean the, um, I'm trying to put this into words really. Um, what I really mean is, is giving students the opportunity to show what they mean across topics in the course and across different assessment objectives and across questions of different demands. I suppose that's what I mean by holistic. Um, so, I, you know, I, as I think I said as the example, um, you know, I wouldn't want them just to have, a, I wouldn't want my assessment and my grade to be based on a single topic um, and I wouldn't want it to be based on a whole load of recall questions. I would want, I would want my evidence, you know, to, to, to come from, um, enough topics to make sure that students can demonstrate uh, what they know across topics, across assessment objectives, and most importantly, of course, across demand, um, because that's that's effectively going to give you the evidence that you want to award the higher grades. Yeah. Um, yeah, and it, most, most students fairly obviously can, can answer the simple questions about, you know, what type of chemical bond joins sugars together? You know, that's, you know, I think most students can probably come up with an answer of glycosidic bond, but you know, fewer students will be answer will be able to answer something more specific about you know, difference in structures between different types of, of complex carbohydrates, for example. You know, and uh, you know, the ability of, of uh, the, the asking questions like that gives them the the, the chance to show. A little bit what more about uh, their depth of knowledge and their ability to show 
that they deserve um, a, a higher grade, effectively. Um, oh, Samaya's so asked a question. Hi, Samaya, so I hope you're well. Um, historic evidence, will the data be sufficient or will you require hard copies of actual assessments? That's a good question. Let me just go back to the off -core blog and have a little look um, and see what it says. Um, it says, um, centres will be asked to provide the evidence used to determine the grades for the students selected. So my my reading of that would be that you would be asked to actually provide the assessments that you if, if if you've based your grade on assessment that you would actually be asked to provide that assessment material so that we can actually see it's not just the idea that you say um we're going to give them a grade a because they scored 80 percent 80 percent and 80 percent um then what we're actually looking for is for you to provide the the assessment information the data that's been that's been provided uh, that's been produced sorry the uh, sorry the, the assessment material that's been produced but as I say it's 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 quite difficult to it's quite difficult to make interpretations on something that was only published today and we haven't yet fully assimilated. But obviously, you know, that process doesn't start until the twenty first of June. Um, that that you know, that that request for evidence. So um, you know, we would give you more guidance, I think, in the in the in the next week to two weeks, so that you've got a bit more clarity as we get more clarity on that process. Um, so to sum up, arriving at a grade, uh, what you're looking for, obviously, is um, consider what's been taught, collect all the evidence together, think a little bit about the quality of the evidence. Um, and again, I think there's some guidance on this in the, in the JCQ material. Um, it's also worth, I think, probably, even if you're not an international centre, it might be worth looking at what we've put together for international schools, because I, uh, odd enough, because international schools don't um, follow quite the same process and they're, they're not um, regulated strictly by the off core procedures we've actually given perhaps a little bit more guidance to international schools than we've than we've than we've been allowed to give to uk schools so it's, it's worth having perhaps a little bit of a sneaky peek at what we've done for, for for the international exams just in terms of the guidance we've given about quality of evidence um and effectively you know what we really mean by this and it, it's the it's the old idea of control really isn't it you know that if, if um, students have done an exam under formal exam conditions, you know, they've sat in an exam hall, or you know, even if they've done it in class under formal conditions, you've probably got a little bit more confidence that that represents their true ability as compared to using something like a piece of coursework or a homework activity where you, know, you, you don't necessarily know whether they've had assistance, how much they've relied on textbook, how much they've relied on, on the use of the internet. So that's really what we mean by the quality of the evidence. You know, how how confident can you be that the, that the evidence that a particular um, piece of work has given you is, an, is, a, is a true indication of the student's ability and how much could it be um, that it's an indication of their ability coupled with their ability to know what to look up. Um, Obviously, at the end of the process, within your departments, you'll just make sure that you think that the evidence that you've got is is sufficient to justify the grades that you're that you that you're proposing, and then you will assign a grade. Um, and the window for that is, as I said, the twenty sixth of May up until the eighteenth of June. There have been a couple of questions that come in. Um, right, okay, so again, this is one of the ones I can't answer. How many pieces of evidence are expected to decide a tag? The answer to that question, which we've been advised to give across different exam boards, is sufficient to make sure that you are happy with the grade that has been produced. Again, do have a little look at what we've produced for international schools. And I know certainly um, much the same for Cambridge International. They've 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 sort of talked about a, a particular number of pieces of work, um, but effectively, it will depend a little bit on on exactly what the what the what the pieces of work are as well. So you know, I mean, if you have if you have a you know a small number of pieces of evidence that are based on high stakes assessment. Um, across different topics, then you've probably got confidence that that will back up the grade that you're, that you're given. Whereas if you're not doing any formal assessment at all and you're basing it solely on you know, pieces of classwork or pieces of homework, 
you're probably going to need a greater number of that, to, a greater number of those sorts of pieces. Um, that's. I know it's not helpful that I'm not saying an exact number, and I'm not saying an exact number for 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 the, for, for the reason that we've been you know, effectively we've been told not to guide centres to say it is this number of pieces of work, because the number of pieces of work will vary massively between centres depending on the policy you put together and depending on um, you know, how long your assessments are, uh, whether or not they're form under formal conditions and and everything else. Um, but yeah, that's I suppose that's about about the most I can say about that, unfortunately. Um, should we also in assess synoptic-based questions uh, on core practicals, etc.? Um, very good question. I mean, the, 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 the difficulty I think you'll find with assessing many synoptic questions is finding synoptic questions that cover the topics that you have covered. So, yeah, always great to include some synoptic questions because I think you know, synopticity is one of the key things that marks out high-grade candidates at A-level, their ability to, to, to think across topics and their ability to apply to new situations. Those tend to be the hallmarks of a, of a grade-A student often. Um, so where possible, yeah, I, I, you know, synoptic question is always good to use because I think they will give you more evidence of, of, of a higher grade. But you know, I appreciate that it might be quite difficult to find synoptic questions that, that, that cover exactly the topics that you've taught. Similarly with core practicals, I mean, again, brilliant. If, if there are particular core practicals which you know you've ticked off and you've got some questions that you can ask on those, again, really good. Um, for exactly the same reason, actually, that co often core practical questions tend to be questions that are discriminating at the highest levels. Um, and it's again, it's the idea that candidates can quite easily say what they've done in a core practical. You know, they can remember you know, what they did. They're much less good at saying why they did what they did or about um, um, using information to to, uh, to, uh, uh, to predict a new protocol for a practical arrangement. So again, up to you if you want to use those sorts of questions, but what I would say is that those types of questions are often ones that um, are discriminatory at A grade, um, and therefore adding some assessment on those areas is going to give you probably greater confidence of uh, the grade that you that you predict. Um, so Andrew said, when setting assessments, can we alert students to the main topics which will be assessed for each? So, for example, if uh, and you know, it, uh, mechanics or electromagnetism or, or whatever, I don't see a problem with that at all. So, if you know, if you're doing this by topics, so if you're if you're using topic-based tests rather than sort of more more um, synoptic sort of style assessments, I don't see any problem with allowing students to target their revision. Uh, to some extent, of course, that mimics what they do at A-level anyway, because, you know, okay, paper three in, in the A-levels is synoptic, but actually paper one and paper two are topic-based. So to say to students, we're going to have, you know, we're going to give you two assessments um, between now and, and, the, uh, and the middle of June, one of which will cover this particular set of topics and one covers a, a different set of topics, I think is perfectly reasonable because it mirrors exactly what they do at A-level. Um, uh, Matthew's asked for linear A level. Do each of the papers require three pieces of evidence? Each is taking option five from JCQ. Oh, that's very good because I haven't read the JCQ details in that um, detail. I think the idea is that what the JCQ have said about number of pieces of evidence is the total number of pieces of evidence rather than piece of evidence per question paper. So although A level has three question papers, I don't think it necessarily requires three pieces of evidence for every single one of those papers um, is my is my reading of it. Um, uh, Shugufta has said, will support materials will support materials be synoptic based questions for paper three? The support materials that I think we've produced um, are not broken up into question papers, they're broken up into topics. So it's not as if we've produced a set of questions that are paper three questions. Um, so it, I think it's up to you to look at the questions that we provided, if you're going to use those, and look at ones that are synoptic, or of course just simply you know, um, add ones yourself. So if you want ones that are more synoptic based, just simply you know, um, 
look back at uh, past paper threes and pop some in yourself. Um, those of you that are Biology A teachers, the, the, the SNAB teachers, we made a, a deliberate decision, I think, not to include um, questions based on the scientific article. No reason, again, why you couldn't do in your school if you wanted to. Um, I think we just made the decision that it was one step, one step of work too far. You know, but um, I think at the moment, what what students want is the ability to focus on showing you what they know. Um, and we just felt, I think, that perhaps the article, although it's brilliant and although it, it, it produced, you know, it develops a, a great set of skills in students. We just thought it would add to stress levels to have, you know, the requirement to put that in. Um, that's great. Um, James has come back to say, um, if uh, um, uh, multi, if you're having a multi-topic test, students will always produce, pre perform less well on a multi-topic test than they do on a single-topic test, um, and that is true as well. Um, and you know, if you're if you're Again, this is this is about um, your uh, three and four on the slide in front of you, isn't it? It's the quality of the evidence and the proposed range of evidence, depending on the on the route you take in your centre policy. Whether you're going for um, tests that are specifically honed on particular topics or or tests that are um, more wide ranging, that will vary the evidence and um, and. Uh, and also vary the the your um, assessment of how well that evidence collates to a particular grade. So, yep, I would agree. Depending on which route you take, um, it will make a, a difference to um, uh, how c confident you are in the grade that you are going to provide for your students. Uh, da, da, da. Let me just check and see if there's anything else that's come through. That's great. So the last one that's come through for the moment is, are there any grade boundaries for the assessment material we've made? Um, for anything on this one, that one is, is no. Um, there's The problem is, of course, that um, a different question, uh, because we haven't produced a whole question paper, uh, we have only produced individual questions in a bank. It's quite hard to do that, actually. Um, remember, of course, that we have, as part of the guidance, um, given you uh, told you where those questions have come from, um, so you do know that you know they're, they're all from recent past papers. All of the questions in that additional assessment material, um, and one of the support documents says exactly where those questions have come from. So one of the things which you could do, of course, is go into Results Plus and look at the uh, the data about how well that those questions performed. And one of the nice things about Results Plus. Is that you can filter out, you can you can change your settings in Results Plus um, to target a particular grade. So if you're looking at a particular question and you're looking at the you know the mean mark for that question, you can change your field of reference. So you can say what was the mean mark for an A grade question for an A grade student? What was the mean mark for a B grade student? So the Results Plus actually is really can give you some really powerful backup data. Uh, if you if you use it um, you know, to sort of back up that. So although there are no great boundaries that we've produced, you can get more data, I think, from clever use of Results Plus. I'm going to move away from the questions for a moment and go back to the slides. I will come back to the questions as we go through, but I just want to press through a few more slides as we go through. Uh, great descriptors. So I've already said a little bit about these. Um, and you know, they are there both for A-level AS and they're there for GCSE as well. Um, they've all been made available. Um, they've, they've been produced cross-board, they're JCQ documents. And as I said at the beginning, you know, use them if you feel they're useful um, or, you know, or use our, use our um, grade exemplification if you find those more useful, but they're, they're there for you to use. Right, there's a massive slide. I'm going to try and summarise what this slide says without having to read the whole thing out. This is about use of data. And I think it's saying, it's saying two different things. The, the first thing it's saying is that you know, most schools will have some uh, sort of tracking systems that you use to try and look at target grades for students as they go through a particular course. And that's, you know, that's great. That's, that's been a, a you know, powerful use of data that, that many of you relied on for things like Oxbridge predictions and, and UCAS work for, for some time. Um, the, the feedback that, that uh, Ofqual and JCQ have said about tracking systems is that you shouldn't be using those for your tags uh, for the simple reason that your tag grade 
should be based on work that the students have actually done, whereas most um, tracking systems um, give you a trajectory to a predicted future grade. Um, and the whole idea of the tag is that it should be evidenced on what the student has actually done rather than on what they could do in the future. So for that reason, the, the, the guidance that we've been told about um, trajectory or target grades is that you shouldn't be using those. Um, the next section there is on historical data. Um, and I think what we're effectively saying is that we appreciate that the grades that you submit this year may not be the same as the grades that your students actually got in 27, 2018, 2019. Uh, for a variety of different reasons, you know, there are, you know, student centres do fluctuate in performance year on year. Some years are strong, some years are weak. Um, we would recommend that you do look at your historical data um, because, you know, as, as I said earlier on when we were talking about the quality assurance process, one of the things we will target is is, is centres where there, where there are very big discrepancies between historical performance and tags that are submitted this year. And you know, it, there could be very good reasons why there are discrepancies, uh, and that's great if there are. If you can justify the grades you, you've given, that's the that's the aim of the process. Um, so don't be, don't necessarily look at historical grades and think I have to. You know, we've got to achieve exactly these grades when we set out our tags. Um, look at the, look at what your students deserve initially. And then look at your historical data, and and sort of you know have a, use your historical data perhaps as a little bit then of a of a of a of a fine tuning you know to to say well, are we happy in the in the in, in the light of historical performance? Are we still happy that the grades that we've given in the light of the evidence this summer are still the grades that we that we want? Um, so that's that's effectively what that is saying about data. You know, look at what you've got in the part what you've had in the past. Um, don't necessarily feel that you've got to meet, meet, match it exactly, but obviously make sure that if you deviate, you've got good reason for that deviation. Um, one of the things that is in the JCQ document, and again, Ofqual has said this as well, is in terms of historical performance, do obviously think a little bit more about your years, not including 2020. Um, you know, 2020, for a variety of different reasons, I think will be seen as a, you know, as its own little standalone um, um, system. We did obviously see a very, very different grading profile in 2020 uh, to what had been seen historically. Um, so I think when you know, the JCQ document says exactly the same, when you do look at historical data, um, you know, after you've after you've come up with your initial tags and you just want to sense check, do have a more of a think about 2017, 18, 19 in terms of performance for A-level science. Great, uh, additional assessment materials. Um, so um, just to say that um, the additional material that we've put together, the ones that have been specifically done, the sort of collation of, of questions by topic area, those are now in the public domain. The padlocks for those were lifted on the 19th of April, so that students have got access to those as well. They've only got access to the questions, but not to the mark schemes or any of the grading guidance. Um, but all other past paper questions will remain under padlock for the for this for during this period. So if you want to use specifically any other um, past question papers, you know, you want to use the question papers that that were meant to be sat last summer but ended up being sat in October 2020, those are still padlocked for you to be able to use, um, and they'll remain padlocked through this process. Um, so those are those are there. In fact, I, from what I remember, when we put together the additional assessment materials, we didn't use very many questions from the autumn series of 2020. So those question papers won't overlap that much with the additional assessment materials that we've produced. Let's press on. Um, so that's just effectively saying what's in the 2021 materials i'm sure you've mostly downloaded them and have a have had a little look at um what's there they are meant to cover a range of different topic areas obviously they cover a range of different demands um what's there varies slightly between um subjects um actually across the three across the r4 science specifications they're actually pretty similar because effectively what we've done is we've collated as and a level questions from well, AS from 2016 and A-level from 2017 onwards. 
there will be some topic areas that are perhaps just a little bit thin because there are some topic areas where you know we haven't we just perhaps haven't assessed that that many that that many times over the last you know, four or five years um but you know, if that happens to be a topic you've you've really concentrated on and there aren't enough questions then obviously do use uh, places like exam wizard in order to, to supplement um what we've produced with your own questions. Yeah, there's no need. There's no need to sort of slavishly stick to what we've produced. It's not. It's not a sort of panacea. It is just simply a. a, a you know, it, it's saving you a little bit of time in in in, in collating questions by topic area. Um, there are other support, and the support materials are, are, are all there now with uh, with the assessment materials as well. So you've got a variety of different things. As I said, there are past examiner reports. There are marked examples of student work from past years. There's exemplar, um, um, sorry, um, examiner commentaries on on different pieces of work as well. Um, reasonable adjustments. This is a this is a tricky one, um, but if you do have students for which there are um, good reasons for adjustments. Um, do continue to, to process those applications as normal. Um, I, I have to say that I don't know whether or not we will make the adjustments or whether we will ask you to make the adjustments. Um, so if you've got candidates where you are putting in um, requests for special requirements, just talk to the special requirements team um, about exactly who it is that makes those adjustments. Um, Similarly, if you have students who have a particular um, need in terms of the additional assessment materials that we've produced, they have you know, a visual impairment or they have some other requirement for um, materials to be provided on different coloured papers or, or different sizes, again, get in touch with our special requirements team and we will see what we can do. We've obviously, just because of time pressures, we've simply produced one set of standard material but if you do need materials to be provided in a different format to, to, to support students with individual needs, do um, get in touch with us and we will see what we can do. Um, appeals process, this is just to, to run through this. Um, so effectively, it's just to remind you that students are allowed to appeal their grade. Um, they can appeal on on a couple of different grade uh, on a couple of different grounds. So they can appeal on on the on the sort of standard grounds that the processes have not been followed correctly. Um, so they can, for example, ask you to check. They can ask a centre to check that the grade that they have submitted to, uh, as the tag is actually the grade that they meant that you meant to submit. So in other words, just a clerical check that you've pressed the right button. Um, so they can certainly do that, um, and if obviously if, if you identify that you have missed keyed in a tag grade, that can be that can be changed on appeal, um, or alternatively a school a centre uh, sorry a candidate can ask uh, or can um, ask to appeal the grade that's been given, and in which case obviously we would need to look at the evidence that you've submitted for a particular grade for that student. And we would um, help you to review that to say whether or not there is a the, that grade is justified for the for the student. Um, I think the appeals process this year is going to be quite difficult, rather challenging, um, and you know, um, particularly, of course, because you know, students it should, students shouldn't be told what their grade is. Um, I think that's one of the things I don't think is said in the slides, but you know, it is part of the JCQ guidance that students should not be told what their tag grade is. They will only know that when results day comes. Um, and I dare say at that point, there will be a number of students that wish to appeal. Um, and it's it's difficult because, you know, they are appealing on the basis of, of your judgment. Um, and, you know, all we can do is to, is to look at that evidence with you um, and to say whether or not we, um, you know, we, we are, you know, effectively whether we, we agree with your professional judgment. It's going to be a, it's going to be a difficult um, summer, I think, for, from that um, viewpoint. Um, all I would say, of course, is that the, the, the Secretary of State has made it very clear that we trust teachers' judgments, um, and I hope that that will also be um, a key tenet as the appeals process uh, kicks off in the summer. We shall, we shall live and learn. I dare say. Uh, let's move on. Uh, just to say something about support and the communications that we're putting forward at the moment. So as I said, the website has been updated. There's a specific 2021 support page, and then all of the individual subject pages obviously have um, 
uh, on the teaching material, teaching and learning materials um, tab, they all have as well their own sections on summer 2021 support. Um, there's uh, one tab for students and there's a different one obviously for teachers with all the locked material there. Um, through the professional the development academy that I've talked about a couple of times, we've got uh, specific guidance support and training in, in different areas. So those are on the processes for grading, um, on the use of the additional assessment materials. There's a session on appeals. There's a session on uh, quality assurance. And there's also a session on unconscious bias, one of the things that's meant to be in your centre policy to show that you have um, considered the idea of unconscious bias when um, putting your tags together. Um, so those um, areas are supported through downloadable guides. There are some videos and there are also some live training events and some pre-recorded events. That went live um, on the 19th of April. Uh, there's a couple of screenshots there um, and do go and have a look at the support on the on the Professional Development Academy and there's a little link you can click to sign up um, so that you can be alerted when events are coming up and available to, to book. Uh, again, here, just a couple of link links for you to click. So um, full subject support guides for you to look at. That's on our main Summer 2021 support page. And um, on that main page, you can then link out to each specific subject. There's obviously important information available on the Ofqual website. So do go and click on that. You can go and have a little look at their blog from today on um, the quality assurance process. Um, and we are producing at the moment a weekly bulletin um, with the sort of summary of what's happened, uh, it tends to sort of add. So there's a sort of, you know, a, a, a sort of, you know, this is what you've had before and this is what is new. It's really quite useful, actually, the, um, the, the bulletin. So if you're not getting that regular calls bulletin, again, there's a little link there for you to, to click and sign up for that. Um, in amongst everything else that's happening uh, at the moment, you probably know that for some time we've had um, the MOX service. Um, so this is the service that allows you um, to have uh, mock exams um, marked for you. Um, and that's proved quite popular. Um, actually, it was quite popular at, uh, at this time last year as, as, as lockdown was, was first beginning. Um, the slide here refers to mostly for GCSE, but in fact, it is available for A-level sciences as well. So if you want to learn more about the mock surface, if you think it might be sort of helpful in um, giving you some, some more information for your teacher assessed grades, I believe that the mock service uses tends to use last summer's question papers. Um, um, but you can go and have a little look at the links and have a little look and see if that if that that helps support you um, through clicking the links on the page there. Um, lastly, in terms of the general slides, it's just something we've we've done to support students, parents and carers as well. Um, so just in terms of sort of health and well-being, um, we appreciate that the, the moment as well as being a massively stressful time for, for all of us as, as educational professionals. It's also quite a difficult time for a lot of students and parents and they have questions and they have concerns. So we have um, sort of tailored a, a, a part of the website specifically for them. Um, so if you think that would be something useful to share with your with your students or to let your parents know about, then there are some links there for you to go and have a look at the materials that we've put together and um, do use those as, uh, as you please. That's the end of the sort of generic things. What I'm going to do, I know there's there's been, as <laughs> I can see, the uh, the scroll bar in the group chat every time I look at it is 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 looking smaller and smaller, which means there's a bigger amount of stuff that's come in. So I will look at those in a minute. But there are about five or six slides that are specific for A level science, and what I want to do is just plow through those for about ten minutes, and then that will leave me fifteen minutes at the end just to go back through the questions. So I'm going to press on for now and look specifically at things that affect us in biology, chemistry and physics. So the first of those, most importantly, is the endorsement. So um, we've already produced some um, some support on this um, initially in the autumn. And then when things changed again after lockdown number three, we updated things in about February, March this year. But just to remind you that the endorsement is awarded as normal uh -huh, this year. Um, 
the requirements have changed so there isn't a specific number of practicals as you know normally we'd say you have to complete at least 12 practical activities um, so that's not the case what we're saying is students must have completed sufficient practical work that they've been assessed on each of the 11 CPAC statements here so uh, 1a 2a 2b 2c 2d 3A and B, 4A and B, 5A and B. So they must have evidence that they've been assessed on all of those statements, so sufficient practical to do that. Um, normally, the requirement is that they must be consistent and routine um, in their competency for each CPAC statement. And again, that's been replaced this year by the idea that they should be competent. They should have shown competence at least once on each of the CPAC statements. So they've been assessed on them all, um, and that they've, they've, they've been shown to be competent on at least one occasion. Um, there will be some students who perhaps haven't quite made that, um, that there, you know, there, there may be you know, one or two CPAC statements where you sort of think, think, well, I'm not quite sure whether they're fully competent on that, really. Um, so we have also said that you know, based on the work that they have done, if there is pretty clear direction of travel, so you sort of think to yourself, well, you know, they've only done eight pieces of practical work, but it's pretty clear in the progress they've made with those eight that by the time it comes to number 12, they would be fully competent. Then, yes, you would still award them the pass. Um, the date for the submission of the endorsement grade has been moved to coincide with the submission of your tags. So rather than being submitted on the 15th of May, which is the usual date, the submission date is now the 18th of June. Um, so you have got a bit longer. That does also mean, of course, that if you are a little bit, if you're sort of thinking, well, I'm not quite sure I've got enough evidence to, to award the pass, it does give you a little bit of time to um, fill in any practical that you might be missing. Um, there is a new version of the Centre Declaration form for 2021. Um, this is moving a little bit at the moment. I think what we're saying for the Centre Declaration at the moment is that it doesn't need to be submitted to us. It would be signed and kept as part of your evidence, along with the, 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 the other evidence you've got for the award of your teacher um, assessed grade, um, but that we would not require it to be submitted to us. Um, monitoring visits, they've been carrying on. Some of you may have had the, the pleasure of an online monitoring visit over the last few months. Um, it is still a, a requirement that um, monitoring visits happen once every cycle. Um, and you know, although quite a lot of you had it last year, which was year one of this cycle, some of you were, were, were having your visits um, during lockdown or you know, during this period. They've had to continue. They are a regulatory requirement. Uh, we've still got, I think we've still got about 60 or 70 centres that we think we still have to visit. Um, so we've, we, if you haven't yet had your visit, um, hopefully if you haven't yet had a visit, you'll have at least had some contact with us to say that the visit will be coming up. We're trying to be reasonably flexible on those because obviously at the moment this is not a great time to spend time collating things for a monitoring visit. So I think we're going to try and keep monitoring visits going a little after the tag process has, has happened. So you know, we'll continue those going towards the end of June. Um, if you haven't had a visit this cycle and nobody's contacted you about a visit this cycle, can you let us know? I think you know, we've already sort of been through our entries for this year. So we're pretty sure that if a centre has entered with us, we know, I think, that you've either had a visit or you've now had a contact from us. But just in case, if you're, if you're, it doesn't have to be in this year, of course, it's a two year cycle. So if you're fairly sure that you haven't had a visit in any of the three sciences this year or last year, do let us know. Uh, but I think, I think we're probably caught everybody. Just on the CPAC process, there are three key links there. So the first link is just on the, the FAQs for this summer specifically. There's also a cross-board messaging that went out in March, just in case you hadn't seen that again. It just confirms exactly what I said to you now about the evidence that's required for the CPAC. Um, and there is the centre declaration form that you need to complete and keep for this summer. So those are there too. Um, past papers, just a word on past papers. As I've said, they're remaining padlocked for the moment. Um, one of the things that we're offering at the moment, though, because obviously um, the decision to to um, do away with exams last summer happened quite late. 
Um, and it meant it means that effectively we've got a massive warehouse full of printed papers for summer 2020 because although some students ended up sitting those exams in the autumn not many did um, and quite honestly we don't really want to have to throw them all away because it's quite a waste of paper um, so what we've effectively said is we are quite prepared to sell those past papers on to people effectively at cost price um, so the same price, in fact, probably cheaper than, than you would have them produced in schools by photocopying. So if you're interested in getting hold of any question papers that are past papers, um, they, are, they are available um, for you there. It's, it, as I said, they are they are effectively at the price that you would pay to have them copied in and, in school. So 20 pence per paper for orders up to 40 pounds, 10 pence per paper for orders up to 10, up to 40 pounds. That also includes the courier cost. In fact, actually most of that cost is the cost of couriering them to you. Um, so, um, that, which is in fact is what, what a couple of you have said, um, you know, they are effectively, you know, being given to you at the cost of uh, sending them out to you. Uh, so if you want them, there's a link there, uh, you can go and order some of those. I just want to say something as well about training events. Um, I'm, we have got two sets of training events that are happening in June. One set is the new to Ed Excel events, which probably won't interest many of you, unless you've got new teachers, of course. Um, but if you have got new members of staff or you want a bit of a refresher about A-level, we do run new to Ed Excel events every year. They're coming up um, in June. Um, and they are they're free events that sort of take you through um, yeah, uh, the sort of the, the, the sort of background about about the A level course and how it's assessed and, and and everything else. Specifically, this summer we're running um, sets of training events called Bridging the Gap. So the idea of that is to look at the jump between GCSE and A level, so that that sort of transition that students go in between year eleven and year twelve. So they will support um, areas such as um, you know, the difference in teaching styles, the difference in learning styles between GCSE and A-level, uh, the difference in the sort of complexity of assessment that we ask, and therefore the, the change in sort of thinking that students need to, to need to sort of gear into as they go from GCSE to A-level. Um, and a little bit more perhaps about uh, you know, the, the, the nature of the A-level learner as an independent learner. Um, so they cover those sorts of areas. We did actually put these on earlier in the year, um, they, partly because they were meant to happen. They actually were, I think they were timetabled in about January, February. Um, so not surprisingly, we didn't get very many, if any, bookings. Um, we have, we are therefore you know, going to put them on again in the summer. We've also reviewed the fee for these. So they were originally being offered at £99 per registration. We've now decided to put them on at £40 per registration, which I think is probably about the cheapest CPD you can probably get. Um, but uh, effectively, having written them, we just want to make sure that people come and, and benefit from, from them. Um, so the dates are there, 15th of June for biology, 10th of June for chemistry, 8th of June for physics. Um, so they are there and available for you to book. Obviously, if you're doing them as a centre, you only need to book in one delegate and you can train the whole centre for that. Um, and there's only one for biology. We're not separating out biology A and biology B because the, the skills obviously are the same for the two, the two different sorts of biology papers. So um, do use those if they would be useful for you. Um, most of those are happening, I think, by the time the tag process is, is coming to an end. So um, you might even find that you've actually got a little bit of breathing time to attend. Um, and my last slide before I come back and look at the questions. Um, is just to say, um, you know, having sort of done the last couple of years have been this sort of it's been the sort of blinkers approach, really, hasn't it? It's been sort of let's hunker down and get on with 2020, which is going to be mad in terms of centre assess grades, uh, and we'll deal with 2021 when it comes around. And of course, 2021 comes around and we go through another series of lockdowns and the blinkers go back on again. And it's let's, let's just make sure we get the tags right for 2021. Um, and of course, 2022 is is uh, is imminently coming up on us. In fact, you know, it's only another three or four months before you'll be welcoming kids back to, 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 to start uh, the next academic year. Um, we haven't forgotten about that. We haven't lost sight of the fact that there will be um, a set of students that start a level um, in September who have had a pretty patchy year 10 and an extremely patchy year 11. Um, and those students are starting a level, probably not having covered all of the GCSE course. And if they have covered the GCSE course, they probably haven't done it in, as, in anywhere near enough detail. 
um, and they are therefore going to be at a pretty significant disadvantage when it comes to starting their A-level course. So, yep, we are aware of that. We've already started discussions with the other awarding bodies and with Ofqual and with the DfE about what we do about that. Um, and we're looking at the moment at three different areas, um, which are uh, changes to the spec content, uh, changes to the way in which the course will be assessed, and changes to the practical endorsement. Um, and that will obviously, the changes to the practical endorsement will also apply to your current year 12, of course, who have who have done very little, um, again, um, uh, if any, um, assessment of, of practical work over the last, over the last um, school year. At the moment, you know, everyone is now, as I said, blinkers have gone on to look at 2021. Um, but we are hoping that we'll be able to get some information out before the end of this academic year about what you might expect in 2022. Um, and then a little bit more information, obviously, when schools go back in September and we've had the, the summer holiday to think about these and uh, these things in a bit more detail. But um, you know, I think the key thing to note is that you know, 2022 is not going to be a normal year either. I, I think we are hoping we will go back to exams. Um, that's, the, that's the intention. But it may well be that there are some modifications to the exams, both in terms of specification content and in terms of, of, of the, the nature of the assessment. But obviously, more of that um, as we know. That is the last slide. So I can now go back. Uh, I'm going to work through the questions on the group chat first. Oh, I've got to go, oh, my word, there are lots, aren't there? Um, so Megan's asked, when is Exam Wizard going to be updated so they have all the papers that are available? So Exam Wizard is meant to be updated every year. Um, for a variety of reasons, we didn't update in 2020. And it was mostly because, because once we knew that exams weren't going to happen in 2020, what we didn't want is to have the 2019 papers available accidentally in Exam Wizard, and also being the only set of confidential locked papers on the on the web. Um, and that's still part of the problem at the moment. That once something goes into Exam Wizard, um, if you then use the question because it was in Exam Wizard, and it then turns out to be a question from a paper that's currently padlocked on the website, um, obviously you know, you're going to be upset about that. So. Uh, at the moment, I think we're freezing uh, uh, updates to Exam Wizard just through the, you know, so that locked question papers can genuinely be unseen. And then we will do a big update to Exam Wizard once this process is all over. Uh, oh my God, this next question is quite a long one. Hang on. Um, da -da -da -da. Oh, sorry, I'm trying, trying to scroll. It's difficult to control the scroll bar on this because it's quite small. Uh, that's that one. God, oh my God, regarding, ah. <laughs> Every time somebody types something more in, the cursor flops down to the bottom. Um, so I'm finding it quite difficult so at the moment to find out where these things are. So hang on, let me just go back again and see if I, what I can't do, can I make this any bigger? Oh, I can, that's gonna help me scroll down a bit. That's gonna be much easier. Oh, my word. This is quite fun. Uh, so, so going back, Lucy has said, regarding the assessments, there seems to be an idea so that we can tell students what specification points are coming up on a paper. Is this something we actually can do? Um, well, I wouldn't say no exactly specification points, but uh, if it's a topic-based test, and you, know, you use topic-based tests quite a lot, I think it's entirely fair to say which topics are being assessed. Um, I, I wouldn't necessarily, some, of course, some topics are very, very small, but most topics are of a reasonable enough size that I think students would still have no fixed idea of what was coming up. So I would have said that's, that's absolutely fine. Uh, Jenny said, we've just set the three A-level papers. Do you think that would be enough evidence? Um, again, up to, you, up to you to sort of say so in your centre assess policy, but three assessments um, all under exam conditions, I would say, would give you pretty good evidence, particularly if they all agree. And again, I think that's one of the one of the key things. You know, that um, when you're looking at your evidence, how much does your evidence collate with each other? Um, so um, that's right. Matthew said, if a mock were divided into papers one, two, and three, and taken on separate days, would this count as three different pieces of evidence? Again, I think it's one of your centre assessment, so your centre policies. 
Um, but um, I think what uh, certainly what we've said for our international cohort, and I think what Cambridge has said for their international cohort as well, is that a piece of evidence obviously needs to be of a reasonable length in order to count as a piece of evidence. You know, three 10 minute tests probably isn't three pieces of evidence. It's probably really only one. Um, so do think a little bit about the, the number of, of pieces that you've got, uh, you know, the number of pieces in terms of the length as well. Um, that's the next question down. Blah, blah, blah. Um, Simon said it'd be helpful if we knew this much deviation from historical evidence means that we would ask. Yes, I think that would be helpful as well. And as I said, you know, we may well at some point get that steer from off poll, but we haven't had it yet. Um, <laughs> as James has said, everyone, there's a problem with that. It's exactly the same as happened to, again, in the days when I was still a classroom teacher in the days of SC1 investigations, shows you how old I am. Um, yeah, that was exactly what you did. You knew, that your, you knew that your tolerance was two or three marks, and that was exactly the amount you overmarked your scripts by. Um, so that, yeah, there is, there is an issue that if you know, if you know how far you can go without being questioned, you will go to that point, I'm sure. Um, and, and why wouldn't you? <laughs> Uh, that's a very good question. Thanks, James. Um, sorry, I'm just going going down. Uh, oh, <laughs> James has been on fire. So James has had the practical endorsement should have been shelved for year thirteen. Um, yeah, this was this was this was obviously an off call decision. Um, they did ask our opinion, but um, I, I think I think one of the issues with the practical endorsement has been that there was. There was quite a lot of controversy when when the practical endorsement was was brought in um, because it was a big change from coursework and it was a a, you know, a, a big change from saying that um, practical work would count separately rather than uh, counting as part of a level. Um, and I think Ofqual the the feeling with Ofqual was that they you know they didn't want to remove it completely because the same arguments that came up when when the practical endorsement was first put in you know that practical work is being seen to be downgraded because it's not given 20% of the marks at A level um, would have come back again and you know there would have been complaints that genuine hands-on practical work was not forming part of the assessment of, of a science A level and I suspect that's the reason that it's been kept um, and you know, there, there are equal arguments for saying that it should have simply been shelved um, and I think one of the other reasons that Ofqual were quite keen to put forward was that Ideally, as far as is possible, uh, you know, a, a grade that a student gets this year should be the same as, as as it has been in the past, and that the opportunity should be the same. So, a student, you know, for, for schools that have managed to keep practical work going, um, it would be unfair on them to say their students can't have the endorsement. And obviously, if some schools have done it and have got the endorsement then it has to be there as an option for everybody. And it means that some schools that just haven't been able to do it will, I'm afraid this year, have to say that their students don't get the endorsement. Um, I, what I haven't sort of picked up from universities is how much um, they're putting on practical endorsement. I've only, I've only had contact with one university um, who have said to me that actually they are, they're, they're just assuming that any candidates that start with them in, in September on an undergraduate STEM course will have no practical work experience. They're, they're just assuming this year that the students will come in with, with nothing um, at all. So even students that have got the endorsement this year, I think universities assuming they'll start from, 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 from zero. Um, and I think that's probably a wise idea on the grounds of universities, because even when students have done practical, it will have been so disjointed that in fact they will have forgotten a lot of what they did in, in year 12. Um, yeah, so a few comments about the monitoring visits as well. And again, it's 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 part of the process. If the if the if the endorsement is there, then the monitoring visit has to be there as well too. I'm afraid in order to to quality assure it. Um, and that's um, that's 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 there's. there's <laughs> <laughs> James, I know you're getting quite animated about this one, um, but yeah, it's 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 not something we can do in isolation. It was a it was an agreement that well, it was an agreement that Ofqual came to across the awarding bodies, and that's one we have to to go along with. I'm afraid. Um, oh gosh, sorry, the, the scrolling is happening again. Uh, let me go back and see if I can get to. Um, right, okay. Then we've got questions on the past papers. That's fine. 
Oh, good question from Ben. Um, if we use 2020 papers, how should we grade them? Because we were told previously told these grade boundaries were generous. Now that's actually a, quite a, a, an important point, I think, and it it is one that's quite difficult. So if you're using the summer 2020 papers, the ones that were eventually sat in autumn, um, do just have a little look at those grade boundaries, and also have a little look at the. Um, we obviously produce grade statistics as well that show you what proportion of students got a particular grade. But the autumn 2020 papers were graded in order to give the same degree of grade inflation that had taken place because of the centre assess grades in, in June. Um, and it does mean that the grade boundaries for the autumn 2020 papers are lower than they would normally be. Um, now, I'm not quite sure what to say in terms of advice for that. I think it's just, uh, I think the only advice I can say is, you know, look at the grade boundaries, but use a little bit of caution with the with the autumn 2020 papers. Um, you know, there's nothing I can do to say these are what the grade boundaries ought to have been if it had been a normal year. You know, they are the grade boundaries that equated to the grades that were awarded in 2020. But just be aware that, you know, that that, that as a piece of evidence is perhaps going to skew you in a very, you know, skew you one way. Um, it, and, and actually, it's very difficult to know what the degree of skew was because the autumn series was um, a very much smaller in terms of numbers. In fact, you, know, you could argue that the autumn series was small enough in terms of candidate numbers that the, that the data is is statistically not not significant. Um, it was only sort of two to three hundred entries per science. And also it was a, an unusual entry because it had some resets, had some students that weren't happy with being given a very low uh, centre assess grade and therefore resat. It had a lot of private candidates across the grading ability range. So it's it's difficult to know how to advise you to use the 2020 grade boundaries. You know, just be aware that they may, might have been a little bit unusual. That's, I suppose that's, uh, that's the only thing I can say, really. Um, Right, okay. Ah, there we are. That's very right. Thank you, Justine. Justine has said that you were advised at the meeting yesterday, which was um, run by my colleague Henna, to use the boundaries for 2020, but make a note of it in your documentation. And that seems to be excellent advice. Uh, not surprising because Henna's brilliant. So there we are. Um, yeah, okay. Okay, a lot of these are comments rather than questions, which is great. That means I don't have ones to answer. That was fine. Lots of, yeah, okay. Um, yeah, some of you are commenting that 2020 papers, oh, 2020 papers are on exam words, right? Okay, so they have been updated. That's great. Okay. Um, I'd really like to know if we're allowed to use the 2020 mark scheme. Yeah, I mean, any of the question papers and mark schemes that are up on the website are absolutely fine for you to use. That's no problem whatsoever. Uh, and as Samaya has pointed out, you also have the international papers. So the IAL papers, um, our international A-level in terms of specification content is really very, very similar to, to the, to the um, UK level. Biology is a little bit different because we only have one international A-level in biology, whereas obviously for the UK we have biology A and biology B. Um, but even so, the IAL question papers are still pretty useful. They're modular, of course, so you have to sort of pick and choose a little bit. But there were um, IEL exams in January, um, and there were last autumn as well. So there are plenty of IEL question papers which are all locked on the website as well and can be used. Um, there we are. Let's keep going down. Keep going down. There we are. Uh, yeah, there's some discussion about practical work. That's great. Okay, I think that's pretty much the end of those questions. There's just one. Uh, sorry, there's a question from Richard. Did I did I say that no universities will be requiring practical endorsements this year? No, as I said, I've only spoken to one university, and they haven't said they're waiving the need for a practical requirement. They're just simply saying that they're assuming that even students that have got the practical endorsement may not necessarily know much practical, and they're going to start from scratch. So I don't, I, you know, I've not heard anything from universities changing their entry requirements. What I have heard is from one university that says their expectation of what the practical work will be like is different this year. Um, so yeah, just to clarify that, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm not saying that, you know, that the universities that aren't requiring it because I suspect that most of them are because they'll have already made their grade offers. 
Uh, Matthew said in response to my previous question about a mock being separated into three different days and each paper is over an hour, um, would each count as a piece of evidence? That sounds more likely to me. Again, you'd need to, you'd need to make that decision in your um, centre policy. But if you're separating a mock out and you're, you're having you know, essentially a three hour question paper set into th split into three different sections and they're each substantive um, assessments of an hour, then I would say that you're then looking at more, probably more than one piece of evidence. But again, clarify that in your, in your, in your policy. Da, da, da. Gainer has asked, do we need to, oh, hi Gainer, how are you? I haven't spoke, I haven't spoke to you for ages. I uh, hope oh, life is all very well up in, up in Manchester. Uh, do we need to cross-moderate between centres? You don't need to. It's come up odd enough. It has come up on the SNAB forum, the Biology A forums, where some schools have sort of said they're, they're, they've sort of, um, particularly if they've got small numbers, they're, they're looking for a bit of reassurance. And if you want to, um, and you've got local centres that you that you're sort of that you know that you that you want to contact. I think it's great because it's something you can put in your centre policy. It gives it gives you know additional um, oomph, I think, to the to the to the the quality of the job, the the not the quality of your judgments necessarily, but it gives extra oomph to the reassurance that the judgments are correct. So if you do want to cross moderate, absolutely not required, but it can be quite a nice reassurance, I think, for, for schools that you've that you've um, that you've sort of um, done things nicely. Right, that appears to be everything from the group chat. I'm just going to check the Q and A box as well because I think there are one or two things that have come in in there as well. Oh my God, there are 19 <laughs> that have come in in there. Right, okay, we've got minus four minutes to answer 19 questions. So Elizabeth has said, would you recommend using the 2019 locked papers? Um, again, use any assessments that you want to. Um, the 2019 papers have the advantage of um, of being the sort of last normal ones before the covid nonsense um so you know you might decide that they are they are um, better to use for that reason the problem with the 2019 papers is that although they're locked i think they they you know they've, they've had longer of leaking into the public domain so you know um you pay your money you you, you, you take your chance i think with those uh rob said great stability is important the time which is true how are you rob hope all's well up in uppingham um uh, Elizabeth has said, "Why not use the 2019 lock papers for tags?" And the answer is, you can. We didn't. We didn't do that. We were specifically asked as part of the JCQ um, DFE process to provide a range of options, which is why the additional assessment material is different, um, and it's not just simply a set of question papers. But there's no reason why you couldn't use the 2019 papers if you want to. Uh, Lennox has asked, when deciding on a grade for a question, do you use the mean mark for an A grade student as a grade boundary or to use a variance centred on the mean mark? I think what you're looking to do, and I think what we've tried to provide you with some of the guidance documents on the website, is you're looking at the um, the minimum. So you're looking, you know, in order to say this is an A grade student, you're looking at performance at least at the A, B grade boundary. Um, um, Nick has asked, how do we ensure we've assigned the correct AOs to questions we're using that are not from the provided resources, particularly when the kill question covers more than one AO? Uh, now, that's one of the unfortunate things. Unfortunately, at GCSE, we do publish the AOs um, in the mark schemes, and at A-level, we don't. So the honest answer to the question is that I'm not sure you can. Um, sometimes you can get the data from Exam Wizard. Um, again, it depends on a little bit on how recent the question paper is. But for very recent question papers, I think we have started to tag assessment objectives on Exam Wizard. But if it's an older question paper, you may just need to sort of make, um, use your professional judgment to, 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 to guess at what the AO is. There's, there's no other way in which we can do it, I'm afraid, at the moment. Um, Ingo has said, what additional documentation needs to be submitted alongside an assessment or other piece of evidence? Um, I, th I think the best answer to that is to go to the JCQ document and, and to look through um, exactly the guidance that is provided there. Um, that's probably going to be the easiest way of doing that. Um, Matthew has asked a question which I think we've already answered about the number of pieces of evidence. So that's great. Um, Ben has said about the Ofqual blog, two students per school will be asked to provide five different student works back at the grade. Um, 
how much work and what type of work is expected. So again, Ben, it's very difficult to say because the Ofqual blog is new to me as it is to you. But I, my my reading of the blog is that any um, any information that you've used to put the to decide on the grade is what you would I'd be asked to submit um, uh, as part of the evidence. So, you know, if that that, in, that would include, you know, assessments or in-class tests or, or whatever you had used, I think they would there, there would be an expectation that all of that evidence was uh, provided. Uh, Amy has asked, where can we find the unseen materials? So all of the information, if you go to the main um, qualification web page for whether it's biology A, biology B, chemistry, physics, if you choose the teaching and learning materials tab, and then to, as, if you scroll down that that page towards the bottom, there are a couple of folders. One's called Summer 2021 Assessment Material for Candidates, and the other's called Summer 2021 Assessment Material for Teachers, and all the materials are in there. Uh, Matthew's question again about dividing papers up. We've asked, answered that one. That one I've already answered. Um, Oliver, oh, hi, Oliver. Good to hear from you. Uh, every, is every school asked to submit a piece of evidence of five pupils or a selection of schools? No, every school is going to be asked to submit evidence for either for A-level or for GCSE. Uh, if it's for A-level, you'll be asked for evidence in one subject. If it's for GCSE, you'll be asked for evidence in two subjects. So every school will submit evidence and then we will sample um, schools from from that, from that. So I'm afraid everybody's going to be asked to do some work in terms of submission. Um, Hannah's question is about assessing stock to base uh, and core practical questions. We've already done that one. That's great. Um, Rob has asked advice on how to set grade boundaries for part papers and tests produced from mixed exam sessions. So again, I think that the two things I would say on that, Rob, is firstly, um, look at um, data on Results Plus to try and give you an idea of performance across different grades. Um, and otherwise, look at the information we've produced in terms of the um, exemplar scripts with um, examiner um, commentaries on the sorts of things we tend to see in A grade students, um, C grade students, and E grade students. Um, Vicky said, I thought AO4 included the idea of practical assessment being necessary in so as some form of evidence. I'm not quite sure what you mean by AO4. Um, but um, I don't think I don't think pra I don't think um, practical assessment has to be part of your evidence for a tag. It's quite nice if it is, of course, because in a normal uh, exam year it would make up twenty percent of the grade. Um, but obviously, it's it, the the key point is that students should only be assessed on what they've done. So that might limit your ability to include practical assessment as part of or you know, questions on a practical nature as part of the tag. Um, but you know, nice to do it um, where where that's possible. Um, uh, Stephanie, your questions are specifically about IAL, um, which obviously follows a different process. So um, the honest answer is, I don't really know because I haven't looked at the IAL process in much detail. Um, so, and you've said not three pieces. I think if you're doing a, if you're doing IAL. And if you are sitting the exam, and if you are sitting the IEL exam on the date um, of the calendar, um, then I think that is the only evidence you need for it, for that particular unit. Um, but do have a look at the specific um, international guidance that we've produced, because within within that for IEL um, centres, we've basically said if you're doing the exam under exam conditions, then this is what you need. If you're doing the exam after the timetable date, this is what you need. If you're not using the exam at all, this is what you need. So the guidance for the international centres is really very specific in terms of route one, route two, route three. So have a look at that guidance. I just simply can't remember what it says. Um, 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 Kerian, sorry if I've pronounced your name wrong, says, are you aware that locked IL papers are available online? Um, if you do, and the problem is that <laughs> the internet is very big and we can't police absolutely everything. So we are aware, and when we're made aware that a, sent, that, a, that a website has put up locked question papers, once we're made aware of it, it goes to our legal team, it goes to our compliance team, 
um, and the owner of the website gets um, gets told or gets asked to take them down. Um, and we can then follow up that up with legal action if necessary. But obviously, we only know about it if people report it to us. We don't, sadly, we, we don't have teams that go and scan the internet all day for these things. So if you're aware of them, let us know the link. We will deal with it. It is obviously much more difficult if the website is hosted outside of the UK um, because the possibility of us taking legal action against the school in Sri Lanka uh, when we're not based there is really very, very difficult. So we have to rely on the good nature of, of, of the web hosts often just simply to, to do as we ask them to. But if you do discover things that are padlocked material that is available online, um, then please do let us know. It's a sticky area. Um, because obviously, if you're if you're putting things on your school um, intranets, um, you know, that is all for for good educational use, and there's obviously no action we would take. It's 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 easy if, if um, it's much easier if if uh, somebody is doing it and 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 asking for payment for access, because that is a direct breach of copyright. Uh, and then in that in that case, we certainly would take legal action. But if they're simply sharing it uh, atavistically, um, there's, it's actually quite difficult for us to do anything other than ask them not to because um, they're not strictly breaking the law um, the copyright is the copyright is only for if it's if it's sold but yeah um, and then i think i've answered most of these blum, 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 blum. oh there are a couple more at the end um so elizabeth has asked will our evidence need to include student scripts or just the papers we use um again uh not absolutely sure because you know we, we're going to have to wait for Ofcore to clarify exactly what they're wanting. But my guess is that you would have to provide the evidence for the student rather than just submitting the question paper. Um, Stephanie, can I email you? Yeah, do uh, if you if you've got any questions, do email you know, email me directly or email the team, and we can we can help you out. Um, and Anne Marie has said we're planning on using the assessments as individual topic tests. Would it be better to mix up topics? So we have evidence for exams of mixed topics. And again, that's an up to you question. Um, as long as it's clear in your centre policy which way you're going, um, you know, there's, there's no reason why one approach is better than the other. I think as we've already sort of talked about um, earlier in the session, um, one way perhaps gives you more information about better performance because a student that's able to cope better with questions on, I don't know, questions on mixture of topics is, is probably going to give you better evidence of being at a higher grade than one that's able to do things narrowly. But I suppose the other thing is, even if you're using individual topic tests, you're probably going to, going to, going to be using those in quite a concentrated period of time, because you know, after all, you've only got you know, four and a bit weeks before students go on, go away again for, um, for, for half term. So you, know, you could argue, and indeed, you might well argue in your centre policy that that because of the concentrated nature of the assessment, individual topic tests are uh, are less straightforward um, than they, they might have been if they were spaced out during the year. But equally, of course, I mean, you could be using uh, individual topic tests historically. I mean, you could be looking at how they're done in topic tests in year 12 and year 13 and using that as part of the evidence alongside perhaps a more formal sort of slightly more synoptic question paper at this point so uh, yeah all of these approaches are possible i think it's just uh, a case of saying what you're going to do in your in your center policy great that i think is the last of the questions i'm, I'm dreading going back to the group chat to discover there are another half a half a dozen in there um but uh uh, there are a couple more that have come in. I think they're mostly okay, actually. What happens if students lost some of their work? Um, that's an interesting one, Ben. Um, what I don't know, of course, and, and again, won't know until Ofqual have clarified, is the the uh, the when you're when we ask you for the evidence. What I don't know is if, whether we will say we want to see candidates A, B, C, D, and E, or whether or not we will say we want to see any five candidates. Obviously, if it's the second of those, the fact that a student has lost some work probably makes no difference whatsoever. If we go for the first of them and we happen to pick a student that's lost some of the work, then I think you just have to say some of the work isn't available because you know the student took it away um, and hasn't brought it back. Um, and you know, we'll probably say at that point, okay, can you substitute another student? 
think we might get a bit suspicious if we ask for five specific candidates and you say, oh, all of those five candidates have lost their work. Um, yeah, and the difficulty I know for teachers at the moment is that we, you know, you don't know which which subject we're going to pick. In fact, we don't know which subject we're going to pick either. Um, but I suppose what I would say is there's probably not, you know, that um, if your work is going to be assessments that the students have done, there's no reason for them to take them away again. Once they've done the assessment, you know, you might want to you might want to hand them back just so they can see how they've done. But I wouldn't have thought. For an assessment that's going to form part of your tag grade from now on, I can't see any reason why it would go back to the student and be taken away by them. I'd just simply store it all from this point onwards, I suspect. Um, da -da -da -da. Um, oh gosh, Sarah's questions. She's been told that you should apply a 10% grade boundary reduction to GCSE 2019 to bring them in line with 2020 papers. Um, what do I think? The honest answer is, I, th I think I might go Francis Urquhart on this one and say I couldn't possibly comment. Um, and the honest answer is, I, I I don't know. You know, for the reasons that I said earlier, I you know I don't know how far adrift the uh, sorry that's uh, I don't know how far adrift the 2020 papers are. For the 2019 papers, I'd be very surprised because I would have thought the 2019 papers um, they are showing you exactly what the grading standard is. Um, I'm okay, you might say that students this time have, got, have have been disadvantaged, but you're not actually being asked to do to to make an allowance for that. You're being asked to say the grade that you think they were the the, the grade that their work has demonstrated. Um, so I wouldn't have said myself. I wouldn't have said you should look at a paper from 2019 and apply any reduction to the grade boundary. And if I was looking at a 2019 paper, it would tell me what grade that student would get in the exam. Oh, myself, there we are. Um, Gerard has said, what do, you, what do we do if you want core practical evidence to scan? Students have their lab notebooks at home. Um, I suppose that depends. If, if you're in a boarding school and they can't get home to get the evidence, then there's not much you can do other than say to the monitor, I can't give you that evidence because the student's got the book. Um, if, um, if it's obviously, you know, if you're in a day school and it's just simply a case of the students bringing their books in the next day, then you know, get them to bring their books in the next day. I don't know how much you're doing quarantining in schools. So if a, you know, if a student is bringing in work from home that you're then asked to scan and send in, I don't know how much you're then storing the work for 48 hours, 72 hours before it's handled and scanned. I, you know, I, I don't know what schools have as their policy on that. Um, but obviously, again, if it's if you're, if it's for a monitoring visit, and you have a policy that has a quarantine in it, just let your monitor know that you know you're happy to scan it, but it will come in six days' time once the once it's been debugged. Um, Nicola has asked, do we have to retain evidence to the practical endorsement? Um, and, and so generally, we've said no to that. In, in, in and this year is is no different. I wouldn't normally I wouldn't normally keep um, evidence for the practical endorsement. The whole idea of the practical endorsement is the visit. The visit says whether or not we will agree with your uh, practical endorsement grade or not. So the fact that you've had a visit, if you then say the student has passed, we're always going to agree with that. We're never going to come back to you and say we don't agree. That's the whole point of the monitoring visit. So the only reason for keeping practical work records is if you think the student's going to resit or if the student is potentially going to add to it in the future year. Otherwise, there's no reason for you to keep practical endorsement records. Oh, I see. Jenny's come back with some data. Yeah, um, yeah. It, it it may be that the data you've quoted may be true. I think it's. I think it's. Uh, I think it's. Yeah. And if if you you can if you want to I suppose if you're looking at using the 2020 papers you can simply look back and say okay what was the grade boundary in 2020 and how did it compare with 2019 18 17 uh, and you can you know, try and make an adjustment based on that if you want to yeah all right Jared all right um, yes. in which case well there's a simple answer in that case Jared we we have we have made the decision for international centers for exactly the reason that you've said we are not doing any monitoring visits for international centers at the moment uh, international centers if you are offering the UKA level um, and you're doing this uh, when you're offering the CPAC we will simply visit all schools from September onwards because internationally at the moment it's it, schools are in such different positions. 
um, that we are not doing any monitoring visits for international schools until September. We'll start them up again then. So you've actually got a slightly easy ride if your students can't get in and bring the practical work in. It doesn't matter. We're not going to ask for it until September anyway. So uh, that one solves that one. Brilliant. I know I'm sorry. I'm, I know I was meant to finish at quarter past five, but there have been some excellent questions. And I think it was worth continuing just to make sure that we've got through all of those. I hope it's been useful. I know that some of you have been have, will have attended thinking that um, we'll give you all the answers and tell you exactly what to do. And I'm sorry that's not the case. There are so many issues within within the summer process where it is up to schools to come up with their own solutions and you know, up to you to decide which way you're going to work things because you know no one policy is going to work the same for all schools. So I'm really sorry if some of my answers today have been you know, you've got to make that decision yourself. But in, in some cases, of course, I'm afraid that is the way in which this summer is going to work. Um, we're always happy to try and support where we can and you know, do look at the material that's available on the website. Do get in touch with us if there are any other things that we, that we can do to help you. All I can say is, Good luck for the next few weeks. It's going to be it's going to be not easy. I know it's going to be really hell for the next few weeks on top of a really difficult year already. The only thing that I can say is you've at least got the advantage of knowing that in July you're going to have a nice long holiday, whereas uh, unfortunately in July some of the rest of us will still be <laughs> will still be working on doing quality assurance work. Um, but. Um, Good luck for the next few weeks and really enjoy the summer holiday when it comes and looking forward, hopefully, to a fairly normal year starting in September this year. Okay, that's it for now. Thanks for attending. Bye for now.